The sinister true story of the triplets separated at birth as part of a cruel experiment. 1980 was a big year for Robert Shafran as it was his first year starting college. His nerves were high and he was filled with excitement. But when he stepped foot onto the New Jersey campus, he realized making friends was going to be a lot easier than he thought. Guys were coming up to him and patting him on the back. Girls were greeting him with kisses as if they already knew him. The only thing was they insisted on calling him Eddie. What he was about to realize would change his life forever. As he found his assigned living quarters, he was greeted by Michael Dometz, his new roommate. With shock in his eyes, Michael asked him what his name was and if he had a brother. First thing out of my mouth was, were you adopted? And, and I was like, yes. I said, is your birthday July 12th? He said yes. When Robert informed him that he was in fact adopted and he shared the same birthday as his previous roommate, Eddie Galland. I was like, July 12th, 1961. Oh my God, I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, you have a twin brother, you have a twin. Light bulbs went off in Michael's head. Robert was in shock. He couldn't believe his ears. Of course, the next thing the new friends had to do was call Eddie and inform him of his newfound twin. Michael could barely catch his breath to get the words out when Eddie answered the phone, and before they knew it, they were headed to Eddie's house to confirm the bizarre situation. Speeding along the highway, the boys couldn't contain their excitement, so much so that they were pulled over and ticketed on the way. So many questions were buzzing around in Robert's head. How could this happen? How did I not know I had a twin? These questions would get answered, but the reality would become too much for some to handle. Also, if you have not done so already, please subscribe to our channel and click that notification bell to get inspired by these real-life stories every day. Now, back to the story. Before the two could even reach Eddie's door, it opened and the two locked eyes. Michael recounts the meeting looking at the two men who had the same grin, the same hair, the same expressions. It was his their duplicates of each other. Every time Bobby moved his head, Eddie moved. And then Eddie would move. And then Bobby would move, like, like they were looking at a mirror. It was the weirdest thing. As they began to chat, they realized they had the same interests, ranging from wrestling, music, to women. They had the same birthmarks and matching IQ scores of 148, geniuses by any standard. They were in shock and awe, and they couldn't believe what was happening to them. They just discovered a long-lost best friend. Soon, this thrilling mystery was about to get a whole lot crazier. All parents involved were just as shocked as the boys, considering they were never informed about a twin. Both sets of parents were adamant that if they knew they would have adopted both boys so they wouldn't have had to spend even a day apart. But the joy of the discovery took over any ill feelings about the situation. For a while, anyway. As news spread about their reunion, newspapers and TV stations were calling, hoping for a chance to interview the brothers. Soon they received a call that would change their entire situation forever. When fellow college student David Kelman saw their picture in a local newspaper, he realized something amazing. It was an article to Twins Reunited after more than 19 years, and it had a picture of two of what looked like me. Looking up the phone number of the Gallant family, David called them immediately. The family had been receiving a lot of calls lately, so when they answered, they were a bit skeptical. I said, well, my name is David Kelman, and I was born July 12th, 1961, and I'm looking at a newspaper. Basically, I think I'm looking at two of me. I think I might be the third, and I think she dropped the phone, actually. When the three met for the first time, the joy they had originally felt multiplied. They couldn't believe there was a third brother, all of them identical in looks and body language. Again, David's interests matched Robert and Eddie's, and there was no doubt in their minds they were triplets. They began to appear on even more TV shows, holding interviews for shocked crowds that wanted to see them in action. CNN Films created a documentary about the amazing story, and when interviewed and asked about the reunion, Robert said, the initial meeting was just complete surrealism, but then once we got together, there was a joy that I'd never experienced in my life, and it lasted a really long time. The three moved in together and started partying like no other, trying to catch up on all the time they'd lost together when they were separated. The triplets became so well-known that even Madonna took note. She got them a cameo in her 1985 film Desperately Seeking Susan. These genius-level boys were smart enough to use this newfound fame to start a new life for themselves. Working as waiters through college, the boys realized starting their own restaurant was something they knew they could thrive at. They decided to open up their own restaurant fittingly called The Triplets in New York City. In the next couple of years, the boys turned into men and all met great women, got married, and started families. They spent all day together as well as putting on family gatherings whenever they could. They knew family time was the most important thing to them. Life was good, for a while anyway. Curiosity grew among the triplets as to where they came from, who their birth parents were and why they were separated. They eventually tracked down their birth mother and after a while communicating, she agreed to meet. 
It wasn't a joyful reunion, but it wasn't one filled with sorrow either. She was a young woman when she got pregnant by a man she barely knew. She decided to give the triplets up for adoption as she wasn't ready to become a mother. She had clearly suffered from a life abused by alcohol, and the men weren't interested in furthering a relationship after the initial meeting. After all, they all already had loving parents. Their birth mother didn't know that they were going to be separated, and she couldn't shed light as to why they were. But David knew he wanted more answers, so he initiated an investigation. All of us had been adopted from Louise Wise Services. Our parents, they, they, they wanted answers. They were angry, and they arranged a meeting. The agency met with the families, but gave little to no information as to why they would ever separate the triplets. They said the reason was because it was hard to place three children in one home. Leaving unfulfilled, the parents felt there was more to the story than they were being told, and there was. And my father realized that he had left his umbrella in there. And he went back to get the umbrella, and he walked into the room to see them breaking open a bottle of champagne. But what were they celebrating? It was a question that would haunt everyone involved. All of the families involved knew their children were a part of a developmental study, but they were informed that psychologists were studying the effects of adoption only. What they didn't know was, in fact, they were studying the effects of nature versus nurture. They were doing so by separating twins and triplets to see what was a stronger force, nature or nurture. In other words, they intentionally separated the boys to study them like lab rats, with little regard for the emotional and psychological damage the separation would cause. I would slam my head against the wall. I would, I would basically knock myself out. My mother said I would bang my head on the inside of the crib, and I would hold my breath until I passed out. The social experiment was led by Dr. Peter Neubauer, a psychiatrist in New York. He didn't choose the families at random either. All families had eerie similarities, like having a daughter the age of two at the time of adoption. They all had different levels of wealth, a purposeful decision to gain further information on the nature-nurture theory. Robert was adopted into a wealthy family, his father a doctor and mother a lawyer. They lived in the posh town of Scarsdale in Westchester County. Eddie grew up in a middle-class home while David grew up in a Queens with a working-class family. The experiment was kept secret from the families and the general public because he knew many would object, citing its cruel and unusual circumstances. Every couple of weeks, scientists would come into the homes of the unsuspecting families. I remember from a very young age, people would come to the house and they had me taking tests. Square pegs and round holes. To film and document the progress of each child individually. All the boys remember these strange meetings, being asked various questions and watched closely as they played with specific toys. I remember the filming more than anything else. Every single time they came, they filmed. Like lab rats, the boys were monitored for years until scientists gathered enough information to conclude their findings. What they failed to realize was the deep psychological impact the experiment would have on so many people, not just the triplets. Claire Kelman, David's adoptive mother, noticed something was different about her little boy from an early age, but didn't have the necessary information to put two and two together. David began talking very early. I remember him waking up and saying I have a brother. We'd all talk about his imaginary brother. Only after the situation was revealed did they know what was going on. It later emerged all the boys exhibited symptoms of separation anxiety during infancy, but that only made sense in hindsight, she said during an interview in the documentary. What's even more haunting about this case is that this set of triplets weren't the only ones affected by this heinous experiment. There were at least four, perhaps dozens of other groups of children who were separated many of which still don't know they have siblings out there. So why wasn't this information released? When the triplet story came to life, the backlash was immense. The anger toward the scientists and adoption agency was obvious, so they decided not to publish the findings. The controversial findings are sealed at Yale University until 2066, leaving much confusion and mystery surrounding the results. The records hold vital information about other twins and triplets who may still not know they have family out there. Unfortunately for many of these victims, their story only got worse from here. According to Nancy Segal, doctor and author of the book Accidental Brothers, the eye-opening account of the boy's story expressed that the Louise Wise Agency dealt with these single women, mostly Jewish who were pregnant, informing them that separation was best so that the babies wouldn't have to complete for attention, leaving them little to no choice in the matter. She also met with Dr. Neubauer before he died. What struck me most was he showed absolutely no remorse for what he'd done, he still felt he'd done the right thing. What's shocking is Dr. Neubauer's study has been compared to the Nazi twin studies, as many similarities have been noted. What's even more shocking is that Neubauer, a Jewish man himself, escaped Austria when he came under Nazi rule, only to come to the United States and continue the unethical experiments against twins. 
The experiment had a drastically negative effect on the brothers and all of them coped differently. Eventually, they decided to close the restaurant and go their separate ways in regards to careers. They've been pursuing an apology from the adoption agency and compensation for all the harm done against them, a battle they're still actively working towards. But for one brother, the truth was too much to handle. Eddie committed suicide. Eddie shot himself. He took his own life. At the tender age of 33, Eddie ended his life, killing himself in his home after years of crippling depression. Depression brought on by the horrid truth of what happened to him and his brothers. He wasn't the only one to end his life either. Although the names of the other twins aren't publicly known, it's noted that at least three of them also committed suicide. This is a clear indication that separating babies born together has a drastic and damaging effect on the psyche. Nothing will bring these people back, and for Robert and David, nothing else will ease the idea that Eddie's suicide could have been prevented. The adoption agency still hasn't issued an apology to the brothers, but the Jewish board, who many believe was aware of the circumstances, made a public statement regarding the documentary Identical Strangers. The Jewish board does not endorse the study undertaken by Dr. Peter Nobauer and is appreciative that the film has created an opportunity for a public discourse about it, a spokesperson said. We hope that the film encourages others to come forward and request access to the records. The Jewish board had no role in the separation of twins adopted through Louise Wise. Although the results were never published, Dr. Segal came to her own conclusions about the study, citing that, Nobauer's study found that the genes have more pervasive influence than we thought, as most of the separated twins involved in the unethical experiment ended up being extremely alike, even in death. The brothers are now 56 and still fighting for justice in this case. Although they can't get back the 20 years stolen from them, they deserve at the very least recognition and respect. They refer to us as participants, he said. We weren't participants, we were victims. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and consider sharing it with someone who may find it interesting too. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next one.